Welcome to Strip Coverlet, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I am Adrian Fort, and we are here for a short story discussion. This short story discussion comes to us from Ambrose Bierce, an occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. Ambrose Bierce. So, what happens in an occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge? Um, there are three Roman numeral headings here. We have one, two, and three. In one, we meet an anonymous man who we later learn to be Peyton Farquhar. Farquhar. Peyton. Peyton is with us. Uh, and he is about to be hung from a bridge. We don't know why. We just know that he's there. Seems like a pretty decent setup. In two, we have a flashback. We have Peyton spending time with his wife as a fellow Southerner approaches, and that fellow Southerner is a Confederate soldier. That Confederate soldier tips Peyton off that he could be something of a war hero, as there are strategic assets which are vulnerable to striking, and Peyton could do that. So we're left to assume um, Peyton is under the mindset that he is going to go and attack these vulnerable assets, but that fe fellow Southerner, that Confederate soldier, well, he was a Yankee scout. He was not a fellow Southerner. He was a Union soldier. Um, so we are left to assume that when Peyton did set out, to do these nefarious deeds, he was set up. He was caught. Uh, it was not a joke, but definitely someone trying to wrangle um, Southern sympathizers into outing themselves and uh, committing crimes that would ultimately be caught. Uh, we are left to assume that Peyton did not, in fact, attack these vulnerable assets. That he was caught in the um, he was caught in the attempt at attacking said vulnerable assets. Um, and in three, in the third little segment of this short short story, Peyton is hung, but as he is falling, the rope snaps. The rope snaps and he plunges into the river beneath. Um, as he does, <clears throat> he as he begins his escape, the soldiers, the the soldier, the lieutenant draws his gun and fires, and he dodges those bullets. Lucky little bastard that he is. Um, and then he dodges bullets from other soldiers who just happened to be there. And then uh, he gets away from not just a cannonball, but also grape shot, which if, if you don't know what that is, uh, it was a, just like it sounds, like if you've ever, if you've ever had that grape seed cereal, it's only half um, as dense as the metal that would make up grape shot, but basically kind of like buckshot from a cannon. Is what that was so he he gets away from all of that and dodging things in the water with olympic speed and skill washes up on the shore runs away from all of the other soldiers that are in pursuit in hot pursuit and ends up the next morning somehow he thinks at his own doorstep diving into his wife's arms. And as he is diving into his wife's arms, we realize that it was all a daydream. And Peyton is instead of at home, he finds himself, he doesn't find himself, he just is, actually hanging uh, off of Owl Creek Bridge. It was a fantasy from a man who was about to die. So, in this little uh, compilation that I have, this is called, very aptly, very creatively, literature. And it has the author's name before the short story, 
every short story, and then the dates during which they lived. This says Ambrose Bierce, 1842, 1914? Question mark? 1914 question mark. What does that mean? 1914 question mark. Well, Ambrose Bierce was in the shit. Ambrose Bierce was in the Civil War. He was a Union soldier in the Civil War. Uh, in the Civil War, he suffered a pretty bad brain injury. Uh, he suffered the consequences of that brain injury his entire life. He had, in the 1800s, asthma, which, as someone who has asthma today, I can tell you, it's bad enough when we have things like inhalers laying around. I can't imagine having that uh, affliction in the 1800s or earlier, you know. And being a soldier, he had three children. Two of them were sons. He lost one of them to the suicide portion of a murder-suicide. So imagine learning that about your son before... Um, <clears throat> I think his son was in his 20s, I think, when he he was turned down uh, by a woman and then killed that woman and her fiancé and then himself. Then he lost another uh, son, his other son. He only had two sons and a daughter. Uh, he lost his other son to complications around alcoholism. Uh, he was a man who was agnostic. In the 1800s, in 1800s America, no less, um, one would be tempted to say that in today's world he would be known as an atheist, uh, but he was at least agnostic, and he uh, he did not believe in the divinity of Christ. So while he was willing to say, eh, you know, I don't really know about all that religion stuff, he was absolutely able to say, I don't believe a damn thing. That Christ said, well, that's not fair. Christ, he did not believe a damn thing that was said about Christ. Um, so while he said, I am, I do not necessarily believe in God, I'm certainly not a Christian. He divorced his wife after finding letters that a man had written to her, and his wife died the next year. Uh, so that's got to be heavy because that was later in his life, I believe. Um, that w I believe, yeah, it would have been later in his life because that was after 1900, I believe. And he died maybe in 1914, possibly in 1914. The legend says around 1914. There is a legend about it. Now, died around 1914. He was 71. At 71, Ambrose Bierce, the wry son of a bitch that he was, decided, hey, I'm not having any fun here. I think I'm going to go join Pancho Villa and the Mexican Revolution. Um, and the sort of, uh, the legend that springs up around it is that he died by firing squad in a graveyard. But that is probably just, if you were going to make up a story about how a guy like Ambrose Bierce died, probably you'd say that. Um, he was a war journalist as well. Um, so the, the, the guy saw a lot of stuff. The guy was went through it. I say all that to say this. When thinking about this short story, I think it's necessary to take a couple things into account. Ambrose Bierce fought for the Union. Peyton here fought for the South. I think... It is um, probably necessary to paint some type of intention onto that. Whether taking, um, 
where they're trying to derive, trying to, well, whether you are trying to say what this story is supposed to be about or what this story is about in principle, what the story is actually about. Why was it written and for what was it written, right? I think what you have to be willing to do to take this, because it's, it, in today's world, it's sort of a gimmicky story. It's sort of an, oh, he was dead the whole time, you know, sort of story. But that's in today's world. That's not the world in which it was written or published. Uh, this was something more unique then. So we're not necessarily, well, I don't think probably you should paint this story with modern brushes. You're allowed to, right? You're allowed to take anything you want from a short story, from a novel, from a poem. But for me, the, con the context that is necessary is that Peyton was a Southerner. Peyton was willing to do things against Union troops who uh, one is left to believe that Ambrose, with whom one is left to believe Ambrose Bierce would sympathize. Because of this, It has to be a little bit heartening to understand that what is at the base of this story, this story is not a journey. This story is a fantasy. It's a death fantasy. Peyton, about to be hung, his mind is going crazy. And the one thing he does is imagines that he escapes this destiny and runs home to his wife, to his children. The fantasy herein knows no shortage of pain. Peyton's neck is snapped before the rope breaks. Not broken, but snapped. Peyton's body feels as he is um, submerged in the water, feels very much as if he has already died. Uh, Peyton is shot. Peyton is shot at. Peyton runs to the point of exhaustion. Peyton swims to the point of exhaustion. This is not a pretty fantasy, but it's where his mind went when there was nowhere else for his mind to go. There was no escape from Owl Creek Bridge. That being true, a man who was about to die either chose to or succumbed to fantasy, and he knew he had made a mistake. He knew he didn't escape in his fantasy um, to painlessly float down the river and wash up on the shores with the Sports Illustrated swimsuit edition shooting, right? That wasn't where he went. He didn't end up in church where he would confess his sins and be forgiven only to fall into the, uh, the, the Union's hands again. That's not where he went. He went home. In the fantasy, the fantasy being survival, stri strictly survival, the one thing that Peyton found worth living for was his wife and his family, his home. But not his home. He didn't care about the home. He cared about his wife. He didn't fantasize about returning to the acreage. He didn't fantasize about that fancy door or the great swing on the porch. It was his family. The question, then, with which the reader must be left, if the Civil War was fought, or any war, was fought for the reasons for which it was fought. 
But it was not fought because they were going to tear you from your family. They didn't say, the dictum was not from Abraham Lincoln, all men in the South should be ripped from their wife and children. That wasn't the dictum. That wasn't what happened. That's not what they were fighting for, no matter what list of things that you want to say the Civil War was ultimately about. No matter what you want to say, no matter what you want to claim. In the event that one is dying, I think the commentary here is to be made. Peyton, dying, about to die, very coldly as well. We have to, we have to take that into consideration. This is a cerebral death. On the battlefield, if someone dies, they don't know they're about to be struck in the head by a bullet. On the battlefield, when someone dies, it can be swift. On the battlefield, if someone is shot, there are many stories from the Civil War of someone being shot in the brain and living. Those were the types of bullets that the Ambrose Bierces of the world had to, with which they had to contend. This cerebral death waiting for Peyton. His fantasy is not that he escapes and defeats every Union soldier. His fantasy is that he escapes and just gets to go home. So why, in Act 2 of this three-act play, why did Peyton make that decision to try to become something of a war hero, to further the war effort? Why did he try to do that? If all that really mattered was his family. If all things, all things else having burned to the ground, Peyton would have been all right simply having his family. I think that is the quandary at play in this short story, and this is a widely anthologized short story. This is a short story that I was uh, signed probably four or five times in my undergraduate career to read, to write a paper about, to write a blurb about, to write a reaction to. Um, <clears throat> and I think for good reason. It would be, for you know, sixth sense aside, it would be for good reason, right? Um, gimmicks aside, this short story, I don't think, gets the uh, sort of play that it deserves. I think that this is one of the old stodgers, right? That stodgy old story that that stodgy old professor made me read. Uh, that you try to say, okay, I'll give you a 300 word paragraph, you know, but we don't really, we don't really, um, I never did. I'll say it that way. I never gave it uh, the credit that uh, possibly it deserves. So that is all I have for this short story discussion. I hope to see you back next week for another video. If this is the sort of thing that you enjoy, hitting that like button really does help me out here on the channel. And if you want to make sure that I pop into your feed with literary goodness from time to time, consider hitting that subscribe button. Consider hitting that bell button to make sure that YouTube lets you know when a video is posted. I'll see you.